Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Welcome also to our first show of 2022. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. My name is Lisa Friend, and I'll be your moderator. So please, put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position, as I have the pleasure to introduce our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Hey, Rick. Lisa, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to everybody who's joining us, as Lisa said, for our first show of 2022. We enjoyed a couple of weeks off, and it is really good to get back at it. And today we're going to go to the best of the Swiss Alps. So make yourself at home. I just love it on Mondays. It's, I feel like a thousand travelers just walked through my front door, and we're all gathering together to enthuse about our favorite travel dreams. And we're going to make them come true as soon as the time is right. You know, we're going to go to the Alps right now. And um, before we do that, we have to make sure we have our right meal and our right drink. I've got some raclette here, and this is a, a standard Swiss delight high in the Alps. In fact, we're going to have some, some raclette in Zermatt in a few minutes. But you drizzle your melted Swiss cheese on your boiled potatoes. You got some nice pickled um, onions and some pickles, and I've tossed in a little bit of uh, uh, tomatoes there. And we're going to wash it down with some nice Swiss white wine. And fondant is one of my favorite wines. <coughs> in Europe, you don't get very much of it because they don't make very much of it. And it's kind of expensive and it's kind of a Swiss secret. But the fondant is a refreshing wine. And remember that when you're in Switzerland, you wanna try the wine while you're there. Yeah, hey, and um, we're gonna head off to the Alps in just a minute, but I wanna let you know, we've been having so much fun thinking about shows we're gonna do coming up. I've just got my, my next three months of shows laid out here. And I'll, let me just review you this. This is just an exciting lineup. Uh, tonight, we got Switzerland favorites. Next week, we're gonna be joined by Samantha Brown. And she's got a new show that she's excited to share and I'm excited to share it with her. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we're joined by my son, Andy. And Andy has lived for several years in Colombia and South America. And I went down there a month before COVID hit and had a wonderful time exploring his beloved Colombia. And Andy's gonna join us two weeks from tonight to share about Colombia. I know it's not Europe, but hey, he's my son and I'm the boss. And we're going to go to Colombia, okay? And it's going to be a great evening. After that, we're going to go to Andalusia with our favorite guide in southern Spain, Concepcion Delgado. If you've been to Sevilla, you know Concepcion. Then we're going to go to Siena with Anna Piperato, and we're going to celebrate that wonderful Tuscan culture. And then Cameron Hewitt's going to join us. And Cameron, you've seen him uh, a number of times on uh, Monday Night Travel. He's our most, most busy and prolific co-author. And Cameron has just written his first book. It's called The Temporary European, Lessons and Confessions of a Professional Traveler. I had to read this whole book because I wrote the foreword. And it's a great read. And Cameron is just such a smart traveler, such an insightful guide. And he's collected his very favorite pieces of travel writing here, over 20 years of writing in this book, Temporary European. And you can only get the Temporary European right here at ricksteves.com in our travel store for a couple more months until that book has its big debut nationally in the bookstores. But Cameron will be with us on February 7th. Uh, after that, of course, it's Valentine's Day, so we'll have a little bit of romantic Europe. And then we're going to go to Sicily with Alfio Di Mauro. Then I'm going to teach Germany. I'm just going to give a straight out my favorite lessons about Germany after that. Then we're going to go to Ireland with Stephen McPhillamy. And late in March, it's Tuscany with Roberto Becchi. So we've got a lot of fun travels coming your way on Monday Night Travel. And it's a chance for us just to share our love of Europe. I want to take you just for a second to ricksteves.com because that's where you've got that sort of a sort of headquarters for all of this information. Go to ricksteves.com. You can click on Monday Night Travel. I want to remind you, you can sign up for the next couple of weeks travel classes if you want to, or our episodes of Monday Night Travel. But also remember, we've got 50, more than 50, all the shows we've ever done. Great Italian wine experiences, St. Patrick's, Ireland, food tours across Europe, offbeat wonders, Norwegian favorites, quirky museums, you name it. It's all right there. Also, when you go to ricksteves.com, you can go where we go when I'm putting together these special evenings. You can go to Classroom Europe and you can put together a playlist as you like. This is designed for teachers. And if you go up here into public playlists, you can just type in Monday, M-O-N-D, 
and you get all of the Monday night travel playlists we've used over the last months. And for instance, tonight, it is Monday night travel Switzerland favorites. And if it has lesson right there on a little ribbon, you know that our um, team member here, Gabe, has put together a curriculum for teachers and homeschooling parents. So you can have discussion points and way to have an interactive experience and let this help your student better appreciate the fun and the learning we can enjoy when we go traveling. And we're going to go traveling right now. We're going to go to Switzerland. And anytime I go to Switzerland, I'm so excited to have the film crew with me, but I'm also so nervous because you need good weather. I also I always give us a, a couple of extra days over the course of the shoot uh, for bad weather so we can make sure we're in these towns when the sun is out. We're going to start in a region of Switzerland that if you know my program, if you've been on our tours, if you know my books, you know I love. It's called the Berner Oberland or the Bernice Oberland, depending on the language you're speaking. Remember, Switzerland has four different languages. And the Berner Oberland is the area south of Interlaken. And there's two valleys that go out there. One is Grindelwald, where all the tour buses go and where all the hotels can handle them. And the other valley is Lauterbrunnen, where all the farmers go and where there's not many hotels good enough or big enough for the tour groups. We love Lauterbrunnen, and that's where we're going to settle down. And, you know, I'm thinking right now after my exciting hike around Mount Blanc a couple months ago, where am I going to hike next? And it's down to two, two, two areas. I want to go, I could go to the Berner Oberland, what you're going to see right now, and make some beautiful six or seven hour hikes from a base up in the, in the Alps there. Or I could go to the Italian Alps, the Dolomites, it's still up in the air. But I'm thinking about that as I watch this, and I hope you can stoke your travel dreams too. So right now, together, and I want to thank you for joining us as we kick off 2022 on Monday Night Travel. Let's go right now to the glorious Swiss Alps. Whether traveling by train or by car, mountainous Switzerland has fine infrastructure, and you can get nearly anywhere in the country in just a few hours. The Berner Oberland is a particularly scenic region. Its Lauterbrunnen Valley, which stretches south from the city of Interlaken, is a wonderful springboard for some of my favorite Swiss Alp experiences. Lauterbrunnen Valley, with its vertical sides and flat bottom, is U-shaped, a textbook example of a glacier-shaped valley. While the main town, also called Lauterbrunnen, sits on the valley floor, neighboring towns hang on cliffs high up. I mean, literally hanging on a cliff. Those are hotels, those are restaurants, those are cafes. You can sit there on their terrace and you can gaze down the cliff into the valley, a couple thousand feet below you. That's Murren, M-U-R-E-N, M-U-R-R-E-N. And if you look farther to the left, hanging on the next cliff in the distance, that's little Gimmelwald. That's my home when I'm in this region. Above. Lauterbrunnen means loud waters, an apt name. Waterfalls plummet from cliffs all along the valley. Staubach Falls, one of the highest in Switzerland, drops nearly a thousand feet. The valley, with its riverside trails, traditional farmhouses, and chorus of surrounding peaks cheering you on, is a magnet for nature lovers. Towering high above are the icy Jungfrau, Monk, and Eiger peaks, named for the legend of the young maiden, Jungfrau, being protected by the monk, or monk, from the mean ogre, or Eiger. And that is the iconic, famous, notorious north face of the Eiger right there. It's one of the most uh, dramatic and challenging and famous climbs for rock climbers in Europe. And they get better and better at that. And I, I just, I'm sort of enamored with these different documentaries that talk about different uh, daredevils high in the Alps. But nowadays they race up that north face of the Eiger. The world record is two hours and 23 minutes to go from the bottom to the top of that rock face. You can, a businessman can leave Interlaken in the morning after breakfast, climb that whole thing and get down in time for lunch. It's incredible. And perched on a saddle between two of those mountains is the Jungfrau Yoke Station. And that's where we're going, by train. From the valley floor, a cogwheel train takes tourists and mountaineers alike on this ear-popping journey. As we gradually climb, the views continually unfold. A 
Eventually, we arrive at Kleine Scheidig, a rail junction at the base of the peaks. For well over a century, this has been the jumping off point for rock climbers attempting to scale the foreboding north face of the Eiger. Kleine Scheidig has souvenir shops, hearty food for hikers, and rustic 19th century hotels, a reminder that tourism is nothing new here. So this is such a scramble when we're filming because it's a sunny day, everybody's there, there's crowds everywhere. We don't know when the trains are coming and going. We don't know when the, the local guards are gonna tell us you can't have the camera here. We don't know who's coming off the train and I've got an on camera, I've got to remember my lines, I've got to get it at just the right time and I want an interesting backdrop. And what I'm talking about here is how emerging economies, tourists from Saudi Arabia, from India, from China and so on are flocking here to the Berner Oberland because they just can't get enough of the alpine thrills. And I wanted to have a shot where we have an example of that cross section of humanity coming to Switzerland. And the train came in, my cameraman said, Rick, stand there. And he gets it all set up and he goes, okay, roll. And I just was so excited, I could hardly contain myself. And I get one shot at it because if I miss it, all the people are gone and we have a boring on camera. Check out the serendipitous good luck of this on camera as we have this wonderful festival of people from all over the world coming to enjoy Switzerland. The craze for social media these days, and with millions of people from countries with emerging economies now able to afford that dream trip to Europe, famous destinations like this can be really crowded. Do what you can to minimize the crowds. Arrive early, arrive late, it really helps. Continuing our journey to Europe's highest train station, the ingenuity of Swiss engineers is apparent as we climb the railway they built back in 1912. Amazingly, our train tunnels through the Eiger on our climb all the way to the Jungfraujoch. Think about it, the Swiss drilled this tunnel through solid rock, it's four miles long. This train is smooth and they did it a hundred years ago. Why? To show off their engineering skills and to celebrate nature. Halfway up, the train stops at panorama windows. While expert rock climbers can exit here into an unforgiving world of ice and air, sightseers get their thrills by simply marveling at the icy views. Continuing up the tunnel, from here the train's cogwheels earn their keep. You emerge at 11,000 feet, the Jungfrau Yoke. Spectacular views of majestic peaks stretch as far as you can see. Cradled among these giants, you understand the timeless allure of the Swiss Alps. The Jungfrau Yoke is like a small resort perched on a mountain ridge. From the highest viewing point, you can see the Alich Glacier, which stretches about 10 miles to the south. While shrinking with the warming global climate, it's still the longest glacier in the Alps. The air is thin. People are in giddy moods. The station is a maze of shops, restaurants, and amusements. A tunnel is actually carved through the glacier to a cavern of ice sculptures, an especially big hit for visitors from lands where ice is a rarity. Outside on the glacier, people enjoy the scene. From here, many venture even higher as a snowy trail leads to more mountain thrills. But for me, I'll call this good and savor the sense of accomplishment I get when climbing to 11,370 feet before lunch. Wow. That was a glorious moment. The weather was great and we knew we were getting some good footage for this TV show. Up next, I just want to remind you, we're going to head off into an example of how they're making the mountain lifts a little more exciting to make up for the high cost you got to pay to get to that high altitude mechanically. And I also remind you, this Swiss wine, very refreshing. It goes very well with the food you're going to eat high in the Swiss Alps. Fondant, that's the name of the Swiss wine I like. And raclette. Raclette is melted cheese. And the problem with the raclette is after you, if you're making, after a little while it gets, it gets hard, but it drips on there. It's so gooey, it's so wonderful. We've also got our pickles, our beautiful boiled potatoes. It's very local style. And when I eat raclette, 
I remember the first time we filmed Raclette. We had it on that big rack and the Swiss cheese was just melting off in slabs. The cameraman wasn't quite ready to go. It takes a while to get all the lights set up and so on. He burned his finger. Everything was melting all over the case. There was just a comedy of errors. And I learned at that time, you need to eat at a restaurant the night before, eat exactly what you're gonna eat the next night when you film. Then you know the tempo, then you can be prepared, then you can film a much more relaxed and better meal. Hey, before we carry on, I do wanna thank our team. We got Lisa Friend helping us right now as our moderator. We got Julianne Worden and she's behind the scenes and she's helping you with your Q&A. And I also wanna remind you, we got Gabe Gunnick and he's uh, heading off to Jamaica for a couple of weeks, but he'll be back with us shortly. We've got Ben Green and he's over in St. Petersburg right now on a study break, but we've got a wonderful team here at Monday Night Travel and we couldn't do it without you guys. So thanks to all of you. I also remind, wanna remind you, we're gonna have Q&A as soon as this video is over. So if you got any questions, I'd love to answer your questions, put them in that Q&A section. Also, we use the chat section here to put links to the important places we're talking about related to what we're seeing with our Monday night episode. So don't miss the opportunity to take advantage of those links. And uh, right now, I want to go to uh, an example of how an otherwise nondescript lift station can suddenly become a hit if they add a little bit of cheap alpine thrills. This is halfway up the Shiltorn. It's a station called Berg, B-I-R-G, that historically nobody ever stopped at. Now they do because you've got this wonderful included little thrill walk. And the Swiss people tell me, hey, we're charging a lot for these lifts. We've got to add some value extra. So remember when you're paying for the lift rides, they come with these little extra thrills that you can enjoy. Let's do that right now at the Berg station, B-I-R-G. Wow, I was gonna say good luck, but I'm saying wow, I'm in Switzerland and I'm about 8,000 feet above sea level. There's the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. And these Swiss, ha <laughs> ha These Swiss, <laughs> these Swiss let you get the sense that you are quite an adventurous person. You have to work pretty hard to hurt yourself, but uh, I'll tell you. I like this. It's a new thrill in the Swiss Alps, and this is the Berg stop, B-I-R-G, halfway up to the Schiltorn from the little town of Muren, high in the Swiss Alps, in the shadow of the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. And I am Rick Steves, working hard, having a great time, wishing you happy high alpine travels. Remote towns may be beyond the reach of your car, but all are accessible by various lifts. One of my favorites is the idyllic village of Gimmelwald. Look at that village there. Just look at that beautiful village. I just want to take a moment to remind you that everything we do in our TV shows, we have an ethic. If we shoot it, you can do it. You don't need any special gear. You don't need any special permission. This is all about accessibility. This is not lifestyles of the rich and envious. It's lifestyles of you and me. It's people's travel coming your way on people's TV, public television. I'm so thankful for that platform to share my love of travel with you. Also, I spend a lot of time and a lot of energy with my staff of 100 people here in the Seattle area updating our guidebooks. And everything in every one of these shows is covered in the appropriate guidebook. Of course, this is Switzerland, and anything you're going to see in this little evening entertainment would be covered in here with all the information you need to put your travel dreams into smooth and affordable and meaningful reality. There's all these little insights to the culture. It's there. You just got to equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart, and you will. So we're going to go into Gimmelwald right now. And uh, if you've enjoyed our program over the last 30 years, you know I love Gimmelwald. And whenever I come into Gimmelwald, I connect with my buddy, Ollie. Ollie's the school teacher in this little village. It's a, just a humble little farm village where almost everybody has one of two last names. It's a town that's one of the most, well, one of the poorest and humblest places in Switzerland. It survives off of governance, government subsidies, basically. And I come into town almost unannounced and, and I just say, Ollie, let's take a walk. And the stuff that Ollie shows me, the town never runs out of things to share with you. And uh, remember, this is a little community where the little kids, they don't play house, they play barn. Literally, they play barn. 
and they, they drive around in toy tractors. And uh, uh, we just had so much fun dropping in on a father-son team doing their cutting the hay. Later on, we're going to see them making the cheese from the milk and so on. We topped, stopped into a restaurant. And we come into a restaurant, we see all the travelers enjoying the place. We just said, hey, don't look at the camera. Have a good time. We'd love to have you in our show. And right now, we're going to take you to Gimmelwald with the help of Ollie to see the wonders of small town, high altitude, Switzerland. The village, established in the Middle Ages, precariously on the edge of a cliff, was one of the poorest places in Switzerland. Gimmelwald works together like a big family. In fact, most of the hundred or so residents here share one of two last names, von Allman or Foitz. My friend Ollie, long the village school teacher, enjoys showing me around. This is the oldest house from 1658. And the woodwork is generally unpainted, just bleached in the sun, originally hay up top and cows below. For generations, families have lovingly tended their vegetable gardens. They still are relied on to put food on the table, and this one comes with an artistic side. Retaining their traditional ways, farmers here make ends meet only with help from Swiss government subsidies. They supplement that by working the ski lifts in the winter. Modern tourism has contributed to the local economy as well. Pension Gimmelwald's terraced restaurant is filled with happy hikers at dinner time enthused by the memories they earned with today's hike. I've been coming to Gimmelwald all my life, and it never gets old. By the way, this is one of my, all over Europe, I've got my favorite benches. Just benches for magic moments. This is about 100 yards down the lane from my beloved Walter's Hotel. Walter, Hotel Gimmelwald, old Walter, passed away just two years ago, New Year's Day, 2020. Bless his soul, bless his heart. He is such a beautiful guy and he gives so many people such a beautiful memory. And many times with just glowing with all sorts of alpine happiness, I'd take a little break from the fun in Walter's chalet. And I'd walk down the lane and I'd sit here and I'd watch the moon rise over the mountains. I'd look up at the stars. I'd listen to the avalanches in the far side of the valley. I'd imagine what it was like through the generations in this humble little village. And what a privilege, what a blessing it is to be able to go there and experience it myself and to be able to share it with all of my travelers. These kind of benches, magic moments. With the world changing as fast as it is, I find it refreshing to know that there are places like this that still embrace their traditions. Dairy is the traditional industry here. Collecting grass to get their cows through the winter on these steep slopes is labor intensive. Each family fills silos with enough to feed a dozen or so cows. But we're here in summer, and the cows are in the high elf enjoying a diet of fresh grass and flowers. From their milk, some of the most prized cheese in the world is still made in the traditional way. Now, this is the traditional way. It's not some show put on for tourists. This is something I wanted to capture. Typically, tourists go to the most famous little kitschy touristy village and they'll see something just like a little Disney for cheese lovers and it's better than nothing that's for sure and they get their sample but I would much rather take advantage of the hard-working tourist information offices program in a town like Murin and meet your local guide and hike up here to this little hamlet get to know this family three generations making cheese like they have for ages and then they welcomed us with our camera but it's remarkable to me number one how many travelers never go to a place like Gimmelwald when they could? And then number two, how many of those rare and unique and special travelers that do venture all the way to Gimmelwald don't take it one step further and take advantage of the guided tour put together by the local tourist board two days a week, cost you a few bucks, and then you get to actually visit a family and learn how they make their cheese. Check this out. We're joining a small tour group organized by the village tourist office. Of the countless visitors in this valley, these travelers took the initiative to enjoy this intimate peek at local culture in action. Once the milk is heated to just the right temperature, the cheesemaker, using his teeth as well as his hands, masterfully scoops about 10 kilos of curds from the bottom of the cauldron. He then plops the sopping cheesecloth into a circular mold. 
It's quickly pressed to remove as much of the liquid or whey as possible. As the moisture is removed and the aging process begins, a wheel of wet curds becomes a wheel of Alp cheese, frequently brushed with brine and stored flat on shelves in a shed like this one for up to two years. In the high country, I also enjoy a chance to hear traditional music. And up here, along with yodeling, that means the long legato tones of the Alphorn. The Alphorn has a range of nearly three octaves. But when I finally got here this day, this man was so happy to see me, and I didn't, I gotta admit, I didn't know why. And he introduced himself to him and he said, For 15 years I've been entertaining Rick Steves tour groups but I've never been there with one of the tour groups while he was entertaining them. And it was so nice to meet a man who is an icon in our Swiss tour program. These are the kind of real people with something from their culture that they can share. It is such a delight to be able to connect with people like this, who really are the living example of a mountain culture in this case. This is one of the beautiful things, again, about traveling. And of course, an Alphorn is kind of a touristic cliche, just like wooden shoes or just like lederhosen, just like folk dancing in Norway or, 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 or just like a whirling dervish in Turkey. But every one of those touristic cliches are anchored in that culture. And with a good guide, good tour, good information, you can understand that it's a legitimate part of that culture. It's for real and it lives to this day. Think about what we can learn just right now about the culture of the Alphorn and realize that's just one little tiny example of these wonderful rich cultures you experience all over the world when you travel. With no valves, it's limited to the same notes as a bugle. Used throughout the Alps, this horn has played a role in this culture for 500 years. To call cows from pasture to the barn for milking, as a way for herdsmen in the high meadows to communicate with people in the valley below and even as a call to prayer through remote valleys. Okay, now, when we were done with that day, by the way, the next thing we were gonna do was go up to the peak. We were gonna take the lift up to the peak. And I was a little sad because everything was socked in with the clouds. But my friends in Switzerland always remind me, it can be milky, cloudy, zero visibility down here. But up in the top of the peaks, it can be gloriously sunny. We got on that lift and went up to the, we broke through the clouds and it was a brilliant finale of our day of filming, I'll tell you. And then you gotta be uh, on your ball because the uh, weather changes and the clouds rise like a rising tide and pretty soon they engulf even the high peaks. But do remember, that early in the morning, it's more likely to be sunny on top. And even if it's cloudy deep in the valley like this, it can be brilliantly sunny on top. Okay, well, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go down into the valley. At the end of the day, we were tired, we're in the hotel with our group, and then I get to hear the tinkling happy sounds of the bells of the cows and the goats. And I realize, oh my goodness, this is the day the cow herds and the goat herds are bringing the cows from the high alp down to the low valley to the farm. I ran around and got everybody out of their rooms, get out in the street, and here we got it. And this is a slice of the real culture that surprises locals as well as tourists when the shepherds decide to bring their animals home to the barn. If you're in your hotel room in Switzerland, just relaxing and you hear cowbells, that means they're bringing the cows down from the high Alps. And, uh, this is what's going on right now in the Lauterbrunnen Valley. <laughs> oh. There's our tour bus right there, our Heidelblum bus. 25 of us are in this humble little end of the valley hamlet, sleeping in a subpar hotel surrounded by all the most magical culture you could have. Sure, you got a creaky hallway and a toilet down the hall but you got the cows coming down. You're not dealing with the traffic jam and the noise and all the commercialism of the famous resort down the valley. This is real travel. This is why people take a Rick Steves tour. And this is a rich 
ritual that's been going on for centuries right here in this valley. And it's no different here in the 21st century. I'm Rick Steves, lapping up the cow culture high in the Swiss Alps. And we're doing it because we're in a small town traveling through the back door. Happy travels. Okay, now, two hours away is the capital of Switzerland, the city of Bern. And there may be a festival going on. Last time I was in Bern, there was an amazing festival happening. I gotta admit, I was all amped up. I was ready to do my research. I was gonna visit all the hotels and all the restaurants. And this Buskers Festival took over the capital city. Buskers, street musicians. On every street, there was a different band playing all day long. At first, I was frustrated. I can't do my work. I wanted to get to sleep. It was late at night and still noisy. And then I realized, hey, what kind of a traveler are you? Get out there and immerse yourself in the noise. It was the greatest experience. I, this is perhaps my favorite festival anywhere in Europe, the Buskers Festival. And I enjoyed a band. I, I met a band here. They're called Tunkus the Henge. We got a link to their website on the, in the chat section here. But I just fell in love with this group. And it was such a joyful time in the capital city. No where the festivals are and be there. This is Switzerland, and uh, it's the Buskers Festival, and this whole city, the capital of Switzerland, the parliament building is just a block over that way, the whole city is filled with buskers. It's an international busker festival, and I just can't get enough of this. So the whole city is filled and every street's got a different concert going on and we're surrounded by centuries of history and culture and people from all over Europe. You know, when you're traveling, it's really important to be sure you know where the festivals are and to be there. Happy travels from Bern in Switzerland. In the 20 Yeah. Okay. Enough fun. We need some defense. We got to remember Switzerland is a mountain fortress. It's lived through a tumultuous 20th century. And, uh, you know, back in the Cold War, when Switzerland said, hey, we're neutral, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev in the USSR said, neutrality in Switzerland, that is charming nonsense. Well, here's why Khrushchev thought Switzerland's neutrality was charming. Check out this defense high in the mountains of Switzerland. Century, Switzerland, famous for its neutrality, became an alpine fortress, honeycombed with underground military installations. Behind this door hides an army hospital with several thousand beds. Anticipating an invasion, Switzerland had airstrips buried in the mountainsides and pop-up tank barriers embedded in the freeways. Every strategic bridge and tunnel designed with explosives built in could be destroyed with a moment's notice. My friend Fritz Huttmacher, who just finished 20 years in the Army Reserve, is giving away a few Swiss military secrets. So Switzerland is famous for being neutral. Yes, but over the last 70 years, the Alps got turned into a huge fortress. Now we have over 15,000 buildings, like the ones around us, with hidden guns. And even the neighbors, they were not aware of what's in. They were so secret. 15,000 underground installations. Yes. <laughs> this barn looks like many others in Switzerland, but it hides a secret. Let's have a look inside. Wow, look at this thing. What was this for? Why did they have this here? It was for World War II. It protected the fortress, the Alps. And is it, was it used later than World War II? Yes, it got updated over the last decades and has new technology in. So actually this gun works? This gun works. Now children could have grown up and right outside these doors not knowing there was a gun sitting here. 
not only children, generations were not aware what was actually inside those buildings. And this is not wood. It looks like wood. No, that's solid concrete. In this town, four innocent-looking hay barns conceal a network of tunnels connecting several of these big guns. With the end of the Cold War, many of these once top-secret sites are now open to the public as museums. This is, this is the gun we just saw. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Yeah, can Sie spielen? Yes, I can. So Fritz, from headquarters, they would tell them what coordinates to set yes, this on? Yes, they're the coordinates, and they get into that calculator, and yeah. the gun gets adjusted. Okay. A quick demonstration shows how the gun was prepped and loaded. This is not just a museum piece. It feels like it could still work. Yeah, if we had a life round, we could still fire it today. And these wooden houses look cheery and vulnerable from the outside. But like nearly all modern Swiss houses, Fritz's family home sits upon a no-nonsense concrete bomb shelter. This is the door to our bomb shelter. Man, so how much must this weigh? Oh, a couple of thousand pounds, concrete and steel. Wow, oh, yeah. If you have a nuclear attack, you run in. You all run in here. The gas mass. Swiss men are required to spend time in the military, including about 20 years in the reserve. And like Minutemen awaiting an invasion, they have their guns, gas masks, and ammo ready and waiting. For years, I took our groups when we had little minibus tours into a friend's house and we went down into their bomb shelter and heard that same story. When you stay in a B&B &B in Switzerland, it's very likely to have such a bomb shelter down in the basement. Remember, there's also big military installations that are actually tourist attractions now. Perhaps the most famous one is called Fortress Furingen, and we've got a link to it in the chat section right here on our Monday Night Travel um, page. And uh, you might want to work that into your trip next time you're in Lucerne. Lucerne's a wonderful town. And from there, you take romantic steamer boat rides up and down the lake. And one of the stops puts you right at the doorstep of this amazing Swiss fortress in the mountain, totally hidden. Boats connect towns around Lake Lucerne. That's its English name, but the Swiss call it the Vierwaldstättersee, literally Lake of the Four Forest Cantons. That's because it lies at the intersection of four of Switzerland's cantons, or states. Romantics will want to ride one of the classic paddleboat steamers. A short ride drops you at any number of interesting sites, one of which comes with a surprise. Imagine, it's 1941. You're Swiss. Your country is surrounded by Hitler and Mussolini. The Nazis are on the move. What to do? Turn your mountains into a hidden fortress. The Swiss managed to make their rugged mountains an even more effective barrier. How? By lots of strategic tunneling. One example, the Fortress Furigan, has done its duty. Recently decommissioned, it now welcomes visitors interested in Switzerland's secret defenses. In, in central Switzerland, we have uh, now nine forts like this, bigger ones and smaller ones. There are installed, I think, in total, 44 cannons. The Swiss implemented a plan to retreat into the mountainous heart of the country and defend themselves with a series of hidden fortresses dug into the mountainsides like this one. Here we enter into bunker number two. You see here the cannon. You can turn it, the elevation and the azimuth. So I can sit here on the gun. Can I yeah. sit on this? Yeah, you can. Push this down. Yeah. 62. So Fine, yeah. And then I go, I want to go to 21. Fine, okay. yes. And you now, do it right, yes. Wow, there it is, 6221, the top of the peak. And fire. <laughs> With the advent of the Cold War in the 1950s, the fortress was retooled for the threat of the USSR. The Swiss have since found documents indicating that both the Nazis and the Soviets actually had plans to invade Switzerland. This is the bedroom for 100 soldiers, 50 beds. They have to share it because they have to work in shifts. This is the dining room and over here the kitchen. And all these rooms and other forts have been built for survival of Switzerland. Hitler took Belgium, Netherlands, and we had the feeling 
We are next. Wandering through this hidden fortress, you're reminded how perilous Switzerland's position was in the 20th century and how committed the Swiss were to defending their freedom. Wow. Zermatt. Wow, wow, wow. It's amazing to think of how Switzerland has this, um, this system where from some headquarters, if, if the terrible day came, they could push buttons and all the roads, all the bridges, all the tunnels would collapse and it would become a mountain fortress. Thank God they've never had to do that. All right, well, we know we got security. Now we're gonna go back on our vacation. We're going to go to a very famous and popular beloved mountain resort called Zermatt. I never really liked Zermatt because every time I went there, there was no Matterhorn to be seen. That's the danger. It's a big, long, dead end road. And by the time you get there, if the Matterhorn's not out, you wonder, what am I doing? I'm just surrounded by tourist chalets. But when we went there to film a couple of years ago, man, oh man, the Matterhorn was out. It was gorgeous. We just went crazy shooting. We shot way too much. We shot twice as much as what we could fit into the show. So the clip I'm gonna show you now never was aired. A lot of people wanna see, they say, "What? I wanna see what's on the cutting room floor. Well, generally you don't wanna see what's on the cutting room floor, but this is a bit of cutting room floor material that I just love. It's never been broadcast, but we love to share it right here. So here is the full look at the mountain resort of Zermatt, beautiful Swiss Alps. at the foot of the Matterhorn was essentially built for enjoying the Alps. It's hugely popular with skiers in the winter and hikers in the summer. With its many lifts, it's a springboard for countless trails and unforgettable viewpoints. The weather's great, and we're hopping a train to one of the most dramatic views in all the Alps. The Gornergrat Cogwheel Train has been wowing visitors since 1898. The trip comes with sweeping views, first of the town of Zermatt, then of the iconic peak that draws so many to this region, the Matterhorn. Now that's the famous view, obviously, of the, Ma <laughs> the Matterhorn. You know, just as often you look at it from a different angle, from somewhere other direction, and it, you don't even recognize it as the Matterhorn. So this is that what they call the chocolate box view. It's gorgeous, but remember, there's a lot more views than that of the Matterhorn. Uh, you know, you could spend days with Zermatt as your headquarters and you get a mountain pass that covers you on all of the, these countless lifts in 360 degrees around you. And the Matterhorn is just a small part of that mountain glory. The train climbs steeply into the high country. It takes us to over 10,000 feet where we reach the end of the line. Across the tracks, an old hotel solidly caps the Gornergrat Ridge. Grand views stretch in every direction. Stunning Matterhorn views demand the attention of hikers. But there's more. Monte Rosa is actually higher than the Matterhorn. In fact, at 15,200 feet, it's the highest point in Switzerland. And a thousand foot sheer drop below the platform stretches the mighty Gorner Glacier. It seems many of my favorite hikes start partway down my favorite lifts or train rides. Hopping off this train about midway, I'm in for a sensational yet easy hike. Getting to these exciting spots with so little work and so far from the crowds, I feel like I'm cheating. And I love it. There's just something about the Matterhorn, the most recognizable mountain on the planet, that attracts people. It's a dangerous mountain to climb. Each year, while well, several thousand make it to the summit, about a dozen die trying. And with global warming, the permafrost that keeps it solid is thawing, making falling rocks a new hazard. Surrounding Zermatt, as if to enjoy views of the Matterhorn from every angle, are dozens of lifts and hundreds of miles of trails. As is the case throughout the Alps, Handy signposts make it clear where you are, what's the altitude, and how long it takes to hike to various points. By the way, those times, one hour, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, two hour, 20 minutes, so on, they're kind of humiliating because uh, it always takes me about a third longer to get there. And the Swiss are fond of saying they are clocked by local senior citizens. 
So they truck out on those walks, but at least you get an idea of how long it is to walk in different directions. And those, those signposts are just so much fun to help guide you through these wonderful corners of Switzerland. It's always nice to hike with a local expert. And to get a little more out of my next walk, I'm joined by a passionate fan of all things Alpine, climber and guide Amade Perik. Amade, this is just a beautiful spot. Tell me about yodeling. Well, in Switzerland, actually, we have four different um, official languages, but we have another one, language of the mountain. It's called yodeling. And if you want to communicate with somebody way over in the other valley, then you yodel. It's a loud voice, but not everybody can do it because it is a special voice. When I speak, I speak out of my chest. In yodeling, it's back in here. That's, and then I, it sounds like that. It's a totally different voice. And you have the voice or you don't have it, but you cannot learn it. So if you're very happy, give me a happy yodel. Well, when you're very happy, then maybe you got a little bit in a different way, like So centuries ago, the farmers would communicate. Your son is up in the high alp. What would you do? Well, then I just give him a yodel and see how is he doing, like Now he can hear me and I know everything is good and I know maybe the cows are giving more milk. Nice. <laughs> While hiking above Zermatt, you can drop in on centuries-old farm hamlets. A favorite of mine is Zumse. You know, I love to find a village like this when I'm home basing in a bigger, more modern village at the valley floor because it lets me imagine what the village I'm staying in looked like a couple hundred years ago when it was just a little humble gathering of farmers and log cabins. That's the case with Zermatt. Of course, Zermatt today is several hundred mountain chalets that are hotels. It just a few centuries ago looked just like Zumse. So why did people live in a little village like this? Uh, the people, they used to live here mostly in the summer. Okay, so this was a high alp. Yeah, exactly, the high alp here, and then they spend with the cows and, and uh, everything up here. How old might this be? Well, these houses, I would say they're between four and 500 years old, at least, yeah, yeah. This would be my image of Z Zermatt when it was Yeah, exactly, that village. looks Zermatt four or 500 years ago. These houses are around that age, yeah. There's nothing new. No, 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 no. When they built these houses, I have to tell you, they did everything themselves. And they didn't have nails. They had to put it, everything together with wood. You know, the wood was little sticks, and then they put them nicely in, and they put all the lumbers nicely together like that. Yeah. And this lumber that we're looking at, it, it must be very old. Oh, yeah. So can you imagine what a delight it is to have a, a local guide like this just uh, walk with you and hike with you? I'm, I'm really lucky to have that. But I'm, I'm aware that I'm going there as your, um, your guide, and I'm taking notes carefully, and I get to pick their brains and collect that all together. And then, of course, weave that information into whatever guidebook of mine you're using. But right now, we're going to come upon a little information from Amade. And it's the kind of information that just enriches your visit to a nondescript little hamlet like Zumze. Again, the more you bring to your sightseeing, the more context, the more understanding of what you're looking at, the more fun it is. How do you get that? You can hire a local guide. You can do your research ahead of time. Or you can equip yourself with a good, a good guidebook. Take it with you and expect yourself to travel smart, and you will. Here's a good example of the kind of information you need to know if you're gonna stumble into a little hamlet like Zumse. That's from a special tree, this large tree, and that's very, very hard wood. Mm -hmm. Look at that on the roof, it's all these heavy stones, because in the winter there was a lot of snow, and they didn't shovel the snow off, and they, they had to put heavy stones on the roof. So how did the people survive? Well, you know, the people, they had their own garden, for instance. Mm -hmm. They got their own food. In the garden was growing mostly potatoes, salad, and uh, also some lettuce, but not a lot more. So this garden could have been here 300 years ago? Oh, at, I would say at least, or even mm -hmm. longer, yeah. because every family had their own garden. These little storage houses, what did they store? We hanged the meat in there, uh -huh. because here in this area in Zermatt, we never smoked the meat. We always air dried. Air dried. Look at that storage houses and they're sitting on a stone. And you're asking yourself why they're sitting on a stone. 
then the rats and the mice and all the bugs can all climbing in and they keep everything nice and clean. So these stones that are like plates, they frustrate the rats. That's right, they're sitting there like a mushrooms. <laughs> and today, tourism makes this little hamlet much more wealthy. Exactly. In the old days, we had a lot of goats. We milked the goats, so they we'd rather milk the tourists. <laughs> Zermatt, straddling its tiny river, is a small town of 6,000 with a big tourist industry. It has more hotel beds than residents, and they're often completely full. Nearly everyone earns a living one way or another from tourists who flock here for a peak at the peak. About two million visitors a year arrive by train. Cars are not allowed. Electric carts weave quietly through the pedestrians. The town is a collection of over a hundred modern chalet-style hotels with a well-organized and groomed infrastructure for summer and winter sports. And this crowd-pleasing herd of traditional black-necked goats, which parades through the town every day, has had it with selfies and is heading for the barn. If you explore a bit, you can discover pockets of traditional charm. 200 years ago, Zermatt would have looked more like this little more than a gathering of humble log cabins. With the first ascent of the Matterhorn in 1865, Zermatt helped kick off the golden age of mountaineering. Then, with the arrival of the train shortly after that, the town became more accessible and more popular. Appropriately, grand hotels were built to accommodate aristocrats who came from all over Europe, especially from England, for the mountaineering. The church marks the town center. And just behind it is the lovingly tended little Mountaineers Cemetery. It's dedicated to great climbers and mountain guides, many of whom died on the mountain. And this tomb remembers the unknown climber. Sermon. Wow, I just was remembering how, you know, we were prioritizing for the high country to get the mountains and the trails and the lifts, and we'd get down into town pretty late in the day, and there was things I wanted to get in the town. I wanted to get those uh, beautiful goats with the black heads and the white rear ends, and uh, they were on their way home. Twice a day, they will go through the town for the tourists, and we missed it, but we got them just heading home, and you know they could smell the barn. We stopped our cart, we jumped out, we ran over, and we just barely snuck them into the show. Then we got into the town and I wanted to get some yodelers out in the street just expressing their joy to be there. And uh, I realized the band had just broken up and they were heading home and they were tired. And I found the leader and I just begged, please, can you regather on the main square? Just do one song for us. Of course, if you do one song, you gotta do it three times to our cameraman, because we just have one cameraman, so we can get every angle. And they agreed and we got them assembled back on the main square and I was so thankful because we got to show off this joyful little slice of Swiss Alpine culture. Enjoy now, uh, and honest to goodness, bunch of happy yodelers and singers and accordion players and so on from Zermatt. Works hard to keep its visitors entertained and tradition loving locals seem delighted to do just that. And I'm capping my day in Amade's favorite restaurant to learn about Swiss cuisine and wine. What are we eating? 
Well, we eat in Kia the typical local menu. It's called raclette. Mm -hmm. And how you can see, it's melted cheese. And I've just enjoyed my raclette. It's almost gone. I got to say, this is good, but that's a lot better. Right there after a good day of hiking, uh, high in the mountains in a beautiful restaurant in Switzerland. Raclette, don't miss it. Boiled potatoes, pickles, and silver onions. Very simple. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And they started many, many years ago in our area. How do they make the raclette? Well, it's actually very simple. You need a raclette stove. Mm -hmm. And the raclette stove is a very high heat on the top. You put the cheese on that heat and then it melts. And as soon as it bubbled, you scrape it off, put it in a plate and serve it with boiled potatoes, pickles and onions. Very simple. Swiss white wine, I find it very good. What is the name? It's Fanda. Fanda. It's a simple local wine mm -hmm. and it fits very well with the raclette. Yeah. You, you do not see Swiss wine in the United States? Not really, no, because we don't export it a lot. First of all, we don't produce a lot. Secondly, it's quite pricey to export. And third, we want to drink the wine ourselves. Here's ah, the Fanda. Cheers. <laughs> and wish you all the best. Nice, all the best. From the town of Zermatt, a mighty cable car takes us to the summit of a peak called the Little Matterhorn. And we're enjoying the fruits of a huge investment in the local infrastructure. The people in Zermatt explained to me that in the last few years, they've spent half a billion dollars, $500 million to improve their lifts. And this lift we're on now is certainly state of the art, and it goes as high as you can go by lift anywhere in Europe. Prices are steep, as the community has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in their mountain lifts in recent years. These lifts are absolutely state-of-the-art, and just experiencing them is worth the splurge. At 12,700 feet, this is the highest cable car station in Europe. While the view of the Matterhorn from this angle is not the iconic postcard profile, the views from this observation deck are stunning. On a clear day, the Alps fill the horizon with all their glory. Okay, so here is a photograph I took in 1978. This is a time when I drove minibus tours around Europe, and it was probably 90% of the people who took those tours were women. Uh, so typically we'd have, what, eight girls and me on a bus. And uh, we'd be driving around, and if you see a cute hitchhiker, well, they want to stop and pick him up. And I said, well, only if he teaches us to yodel. So they said, great. We stopped the bus. This guy's name was Kristoff. He said he's going to the town in the next uh, valley or something, so we can hop in, but you got to teach us how to yodel. And here he is. He just didn't pause. He turned around, he faced the mountains, and he did this wonderful yodel, and it was so beautiful. And we all learned this yodel, and little did Christoph know that 40 years later, I was going to be singing that yodel that he taught me as I was leading another bus around Switzerland. When I'm in a really good mood and I get the opportunity, I can't help but share my Christoph Yodel. So two years ago, I was, or three years ago, I was leading one of our Best of the Alps tours. It's our My Way Best of the Alps. I love this itinerary, the Alps of Italy, Austria, Switzerland, and France in about 13 days. And I just couldn't contain myself. And I broke out in a yodel, and there just happened to be a video camera rolling. And this is a song that once you hear it, you cannot unhear it. And I'm going to inflict it on you right now. And I hope it gets you in a happy mood to enjoy the Alps next time around. Here we are yodeling on the tour bus high in Switzerland. And then you ovulate, I mean, then you modulate. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, Krista. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. That's why not many people take that tour and take another one. Now, it's a lot of fun. You get giddy when you're high in the Alps. Hey, I've had my raclette, and now it's time for a little dessert. And when you're in Switzerland, you can keep it simple just by having your Toblerone and your hot chocolate. Uh, Toblerone, if you've been to Switzerland, you know, ah, this is really a treat for everybody. It comes in these in this fun design where you break off little bits. And as a tour guide, you spend a lot of time giving people what's called a click. You wanna click, you break that and, mm, so good. And um, you wash it down if you want chocolate on chocolate with some hot chocolate. Mm, and that's good. And if you wanna make it even better, you splash in a little bit of peppermint schnapps. And that in a chalet high in the Swiss Alps. Is hard to beat. I hope you've enjoyed our look at my favorite angles of the Swiss Alps. Hey, Lisa, it's time for some questions. It is time for some questions, Rick. Uh, before we have the questions, could we please have a word from our sponsor? Our sponsor? Well, sure. Ooh, I was going to say peppermint schnapps, but I think I'll be a little more selfish. Let me tell you about our Facebook page, because I'm not that tuned into all the numbers on social media, but I understand I'm nearing 1 million friends or followers or whatever you call it on Facebook. A million people get to tune into my Facebook posts. I've got 925,000 now, and I'm having so much fun sharing stuff. I mean, just in the last week alone, I think our biggest um, post was one celebrating the art of Alphonse Mucha. And that's featured from this book that we published a year or two ago, Europe's Top 100 Masterpieces. But it's just a glorious look at the art of Europe. Um, on our Facebook page, we've also got fun stuff. I mean, we got bingo for our TV show. There's four different bingo pages here. You can have a party. And uh, every time I do something silly on the show that I do on all the shows, and you can see it there, you can play bingo or you can make a drinking game out of it. But that's a lot of fun. Um, just um, two, uh, two weeks ago or so, we met our goal for our annual fundraiser for Bread for the World. We raised a million dollars to fund their work to fight hunger. I challenged people. I said, if, if 5,000 people can give $100, I'll match it with 500,000. We did it. We raised about $1.1 million between us all to empower the work of Bread for the World to do great things in Washington, D.C., to remind our government of the importance of recognizing the needs of hungry people when they make their budget. A national budget is a moral document and it should reflect our feelings about taking care of those who are needy around us. So I'm thankful for all of the travelers that joined us in that over 5,000. And we celebrated that with a post on Facebook. If you're not following Rick Steves on Facebook, you missed that little bit of news. I had a great interview a couple of months ago on NPR's World Cafe podcast. It's all about music. I didn't know I had so much fun about music in me from my travels until I had this wonderful person at World Cafe interview me for NPR. It's about an hour long interview featuring my favorite musical moments in Europe, like Tankut and the Henge that we saw just there in Bern. Um, but that's a fun um, podcast interview. And anytime a good interview is done by me, I love to share it or done with me. And uh, just that was for me just a fascinating look at the music in Europe that we've picked up over the years. Um, also, as I mentioned, Cameron Hewitt, our lead co-author has just written his first book, The Temporary European, and this is a collection of Cameron's very best writing over 20 years. It's available in the bookstores in a couple of months, but right now, Cameron's book is available only on our travel store in our website. And how do you learn about that? Well, we've got an excerpt from the book on the Facebook page, Rick Steves on Facebook. So that's a word from our sponsor. If you like travel, I bet you'd like to 
get on board at Rick Steves on Facebook. Okay, Lisa, let's have some questions. Um, okay, we have a lot of good questions this evening. And since we were just talking about art, um, there was a question if from Trevor, when you're planning a trip to Switzerland, do you recommend any larger Swiss cities, any museums, or should you just stick to the natural assets? Trevor, that is the most important question, or it's just a critical question because people generally go to Switzerland for the mountains and they forget there's wonderful cities in Switzerland. And one year I decided I'd want to do a TV show of Switzerland, not going into any mountains and just show off the urban delights of Switzerland. Bern, Lucerne, Zurich, Lausanne. Le there's, there's so many great cities to see in Switzerland and they have amazing charms. If you go to ricksteves.com, go into the TV section, look under Switzerland, there's 150 shows there. They're all free. You can watch them without any breaks, without me interrupting, no commercials or anything like that. Just click and watch urban Switzerland for half an hour and you'll see what I mean. But a good look at Switzerland has a balance of the cities and the mountains. Thank you. Rowena in Kenmore wants to know, 11,000 feet for the young Frau Yoke, is there a problem with altitude sickness? Hey Rowena, I went to Kenmore Elementary. Maybe we were neighbors. <laughs> I love Kenmore. Hey, um, altitude sickness, um, you, you can take a lift as high as 12,000 feet. And when you're up there, you do feel lightheaded and it is, you get exhausted hiking stairs. And you can't imagine somebody going up much higher than that if you're, if you're not a mountain climber, like, like I'm not a mountain climber and it's, you feel the thin altitude. Um, I find it's just kind of a fun experience. You just feel a little woozy. You feel a little bit um, uh, lightheaded. You get winded in a hurry when you're at 12,000 feet. I, I'll tell you a little story. Can I tell you a little story? Please. Once I did a stupid thing, I was sliding down the glacier on a garbage bag and I got going so fast I couldn't stop. And it was icy and I thought I was gonna go over a cliff. And I thought the only way I can stop myself is to jam my hands into the ice. Mm. And I did it, I stopped myself, I saved my life, but I had a bloody butt and a very bloody set of fingers. And I went down to the doctor, in the valley floor and he just thought another stupid tourist and he sprayed some stuff and he said get out of here and then i had paid for an all-day pass on all the lifts that day so i thought well i got to keep traveling so that afternoon i went up to the jungfrau and i got up to twelve thousand six hundred feet after losing all that blood and it's the only time in my whole life i've ever passed out i passed out in the elevator on the jungfrau <laughs> i bet you didn't know that i just told you back out and i thought I've never blacked out before. Well, I lost some blood and that combined with the thin altitude, it must have all been a perfect storm of silliness and um, I learned a lesson. So don't lose a lot of blood. And remember, uh, you get a little thin headed when you're up on top of the mountains. In the script, I think I said, everybody's in a good mood. You're giddy. You do the halfway to heaven tango, I call it. I'm sorry, I cannot believe that story. I don't, I don't um, tell that story unless I've been drinking um, <laughs> chocolate for two shows. Um. Let's see, so continuing on with weather, uh, it was wonderful to see uh, the Alpenhorn player, but did the fog disappoint you? Were you sad for the shot that it wasn't clear? You know, it's, I remember vividly we got there and I just thought, oh, it's cloudy. It was just milky and all you could do is like ghostly, you could see the chalet, you know, and you could hear the, the goats or the cows or whatever, but you couldn't see them. And then there's the, the man with his majestic Alphorn and then we started filming him and we realized this is really a blessing. It is so ethereal. It was almost mystical. And this gorgeous man with his beautiful Alphorn and shrouded in those clouds. And it really focused all attention on him. And it kind of took us out of the 21st century and it made it a timeless scene. And I think it was some beautiful filming. So in that odd case, to have all those clouds was a, was a real, real bonus. And then I remember I was a little depressed because we had to go to the top of the mountain. And as I think I mentioned, we got on the lift a couple hours later, milky clouds down here. And then we just popped through those clouds and it was squintier eyes bright. It was like glorious cut glass peaks, brilliant blue sky, you know, twinkling everything. The light, the color was just popping. And I was reminded it can be all socked in in the valley floor. Local people will look up into the clouds and they say, yep, get on the lift. It's good up on top. And as you know, I think Lisa from Gimmelwald, 
the people in Gimmelwald know, hey, I'm the Schildhorn, it's fine, but don't dilly-dally because as the barometric pressure changes or whatever happens in the afternoon, that bed of clouds rises. And I remember I was on the Schildhorn with some important work to do and I could see the tide coming in as far as those clouds covering up those peaks. And I knew we got about half an hour, let's get busy. And I'm sad for people who dilly-dally down in the valley when it's sunny in the morning and it gets socked in in the afternoon. You need to be the early bird to catch the peaks. Yes, sure do. Uh, people want to know, more than one people, uh, why were the cows wearing flowers and do they do that parade every day like the goats? Oh, no, that was, I don't know about the flowers, but that was for real. That's not a touristy thing. You don't see that very often, but there is the ritual. When they bring the cows down, they put the big bells on them and they deck them out in alpine flowers, you know, and they bring them down. But it just takes the valley by storm. People shut down their stores, their little shops. Everybody gets out into the streets. It's a, it's a festive day. It's a happy time because the cows are coming down. Yeah, so that would happen people. in September usually? Um, you know, I don't know exactly, um, but it is something that they don't have a date. I mean, yes, it would be a seasonal thing, and it would probably be the end of the, the summer season when they're up in the high meadow, because you got the high meadow, and then they close that down, and they go down into the valley floor at the end of the, of the season, so it's probably in the fall. Okay, and then our last question. Um, <laughs> you were talking in the video about a bench for a magic moment. And that really struck home with me. And I wanted to know if you, do you have a bench in every port? A bench in every port. You know, looking at that bench, I just really had very, very special memories. I mean, I've had so many beautiful days in that little village. And if I have a favorite place, whether it's on a fjord or on the south coast of Portugal or on a hill town in Tuscany or maybe on, on the Rhine River or the Loire Valley, I usually have a little spot I like to go where I just can feel the wind, you know, a ruined castle on a little hilltop above Assisi where St. Francis was. And I go there and I just take a moment to really get into it. You know, whether it's the Riviera or a hill town or an Alpine village. I was just hiking around Mount Blanc with my girlfriend Shelly and uh, several times we just realized, hey, let's put on our shoes and go outside. It's not time for bed. You know, we want to go out there and enjoy the stars and, and just feel the, the bite in the air. And uh, you gotta take those moments. Too many people are, are in the hotel bar just looking at a TV show when they could be out there on a bench enjoying something magic. You gotta find the moments. And uh, the mark of a good traveler is a traveler who takes home those moments, those memories. So yeah, I, I treasure those little benches, those little special spots around Europe and, and they're waiting for all of us. And that's a nice question. Thank you very much for that. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed our look at the Swiss Alps. I want to remind you, we've got a lot of travel coming up. Next week, we're going to be hanging out with Samantha Brown. And she's uh, just, uh, we all know and love her work. She's been on public television now for four or five years. She's been making TV travel shows for, I don't know, 20, more than 20 years. Samantha's great. She's been on our Monday night travel before, and we're going to have her again next Monday. Also, two weeks from tonight, we're going to be joined by my son, Andy. Andy's a great traveler. He's lived, he's spent several wonderful years in Colombia and South America. And uh, he's going to share with us his love of Colombia. And I can hardly wait to take you to Colombia, thanks to Andy. After that, we've got just week after week of travel. So happy new year. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to close with a few bloopers to remind you that if you're not screwing up and laughing at yourself, you're not having enough fun. Because part of traveling is getting out of your comfort zone and making those mistakes and enjoying the bumps in the road. Let's have a few bloopers right now. Thanks so much and happy travels. Okay. okay. Do I look macho? Feel good. Got A. Hey. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. The Cistercians worked to recreate the poverty in the Cisimpamplebla. Whether enjoying its traditional culture high in the mountains or savoring the joys of good la mar and living in the world, there's a world of cultural riches outside of Prague. And in this, uh, this was the, sorry, okay. These were the early Greeks. Ha, ha, ho, ha. The hostage crisis was a way to radicalize the industrial. With an order, order, 
helps prepare you to better appreciate the actual her historic sites. Are you ready to travel? Let's go. Traditions are strong here. If you're looking for this today, as we ponder today, as we ponder the caves, the king gave a balcony from this speech. Transcribing texts was an important work at the Cluny at the at the abbeys before there was a printing press. This became a center of the Cathars, a heretical group of Christians, a heretical group of Christians. But if it decided to walk, it would walk like a monster, stiffly, with no understanding of the subtle interplay between hips and shoulders. <laughs>